Hello and welcome to today's ACM Learning Webinar. This webcast reflects ACM's deep commitment to lifelong learning, aiming to empower computing professionals and students who join ACM's worldwide community of over 100,000 members. My name is Li Guo Huang. I'm currently an associate professor in the Computer Science and Engineering Department at the Southern Methodist University. I received both my doctorates and master's degrees from the Computer Science Department and Center for Systems and Software Engineering at the University of Southern California, where I study under today's presenter, Professor Barry Bain. My current research centers around mining systems and software engineering repository, software mo uh, process modeling, simulation and improvement, software quality assurance, value-based software engineering, and empirical software engineering. ACM offers innovative educational and professional development resources that bolster skill sets and enhance career development opportunities. Our members are able to stay competitive in the dynamic computing world with a range of ACM Learning Center online resources at learning.acm.org. You can see some of the highlights on your screen. ACM recognizes the role of computing in driving the innovations that sustain competitiveness in a global environment. Together with timely computing information published by ACM, access to ACM Digital Library, the, world, the world's most compre comprehensive database of computing literature, and international conferences that draw leading experts on a broad spectrum of computing topics, support for education and research, including curriculum development, teacher training, the ACM Turing and ACM Infosys Foundation Awards. ACM enables its members to solve critical problems using new technology that enriches our lives and advances our society in the digital age. Before we get started, I would like to mention a few housekeeping items show on the slides in front of you. In the top right corner of the slide area on your screen, there is a button that will allow you to enlarge the slides. You may also enlarge the slides at any time by dragging the corner of the slide window. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. You can minimize the slide area, Q&A, and bio screens using the button on the bottom panel. You can also use a number of widgets also found on the bottom panel, including Facebook, Twitter, Wikipedia, and the resource list, where you can get a copy of the slides. If you are experiencing problems with the program, please press the F5 key on your keyboard if you are using Windows, or Command plus R if you are on a Mac, to refresh your console or close and relaunch the presentation. You can also visit the webcast help guide by clicking on the help widget below the slide window. To control volume, adjust Hello and welcome to today's ACM Learning Webinar. This webcast reflects ACM's deep commitment to lifelong learning, aiming to empower computing professionals and students who join ACM's worldwide community of over 100,000 members. My name is Li Guo Huang. I'm currently an associate professor in the Computer Science and Engineering Department at the Southern Methodist University. I received both my doctorates and master's degrees from the Computer Science Department and Center for Systems and Software Engineering at the University of Southern California, where I study under today's presenter, Professor Barry Bain. My current research centers around mining systems and software engineering repository, software mo uh, process modeling, simulation and improvement, software quality assurance, value-based software engineering, and empirical software engineering.
ACM offers innovative educational and professional development resources that bolster skill sets and enhance career development opportunities. Our members are able to stay competitive in the dynamic computing world with a range of ACM Learning Center online resources at learning.acm.org. You can see some of the highlights on your screen. ACM recognizes the role of computing in driving the innovations that sustain competitiveness in a global environment. Together with timely computing information published by ACM, access to ACM Digital Library, the, word, the world's most compre comprehensive database of computing literature, and international conferences that draw leading experts on a broad spectrum of computing topics. Support for education and research, including curriculum development, teacher training, the ACM Turing and ACM Infosys Foundation Awards. ACM enables its members to solve critical problems using new technology that enriches our lives and advances our society in the digital age. Before we get started, I would like to mention a few housekeeping items show on the slides in front of you. In the top right corner of the slide area on your screen, there is a button that will allow you to enlarge the slides. You may also enlarge the slides at any time by dragging the corner of the slide window. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. You can minimize the slide area, Q&A, and bio screens using the button on the bottom panel. You can also use a number of widgets also found on the bottom panel, including Facebook, Twitter, Wikipedia, and a resource list where you can get a copy of the slides. If you are experiencing problems with the program, please press the F5 key on your keyboard if you are using Windows or Command plus R if you are on a Mac to refresh your console or close and relaunch the presentation. You can also visit the webcast help guide by clicking on the help widget below the slide window. To control volume, adjust the master volume on your computer. At the end of our presentation, we will have time for questions, and we hope you will have several. If you think of a question during the presentation, please type it into the Q&A box and click on the Submit button. You do not need to wait until the end of the presentation to begin submitting questions. You may also use the Q&A box and the survey at the end to suggest topics for future webinars of interest to you. At the end of the presentation, you will see a survey, survey URL on the final slide. Please take a few minutes to fill it out to help us improve your next webinar experience. This session is being recorded and will be archived. You will receive an automatic email notification when it is available, or you can check learning.acm.org in a few days for updates. You can now use Facebook and Twitter widgets on the bottom panel to share the presentation link with your friends as well as tweet comments and questions using the hashtag ACMWebinarIC SM. We will be watching for your tweets. Today's presentation is the Incremental Commitment Spiral Model, ICSM, Principles and Practices for Successful Systems and Software by Dr. Barry Beam. Dr. Barry Beam is the TRW professor in the USC Computer Sciences and Industrial and Systems Engineering Department. He is also the chief scientist of the DOD Stevens USC Systems Engineering Research Center, and the founding director of the USC Center for Systems and Software Engineering. He was director of DARPA, ISTO, from 1989 through 1992 at TRW from 1973 through 89, at RAND Corporation from 1959 through 73, and at General Dynamics from 1955 through 59. His contributions include 
the Kokomo family of cost models and the spiral family of process models. He is a fellow of the ACM, AIAA, IEEE, and INCOS, and a member of the U.S. National Academy of Science, uh, National Academy of Engineering. Professor Bay, we look forward to your presentation here today. Okay, thank you, Li Guo. Uh, we'll go to the next slide, which gives the goals of the webinar. First, uh, good morning or good afternoon to everybody. Uh, 2013 is the 25th anniversary of the original publication of the spiral model, and we've had about 25 years of experience with people having successes with it and difficulties with it, and have been trying to improve it uh, to avoid the difficulties. Uh, so that has culminated in the incremental commitment version of it that you'll hear about today. Uh, I will skip a few charts just to keep within the time window, but uh, if you have any questions about some of the missing charts, uh, feel free to ask the questions and we'll cover them in the question and answer period. So what we'll try to do with the webinar is to uh, help people understand uh, first, yeah, what is the, the nature of future software and system engineering uh, challenges and uh, how these are going to uh, uh, make it difficult to solve the challenges using traditional methods. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll look at how you can address the challenges and, and uh, obtain successful results uh, using the incremental commitment spiral model and also use it in analyzing various kinds of decision issues uh, in terms of the total development context. So uh, give a few case studies that, that show uh, what happens when you uh, follow the processes and principles and, and what happens when you don't. So uh, in terms of current and future process challenges, uh, one of the things that is uh, going to be different, uh, increasingly different in the future is that uh, many of the systems that you'll be uh, developing or uh, participating in uh, will be multi-owner, multi-mission systems of systems like integrated supply chain management systems that uh, uh, have to do both strategic planning of, of, uh, of your product or product line, marketing, supporting merchandising and outsourcing and just-in-time manufacturing and logistics and finance and customer relations management. And a, a good deal of these things are going to be done by people that you are forming uh, the equivalent of strategic partnerships with. Uh, so, uh, uh, you, Frequently, these have over 50 separately evolving external systems and services, which report up different management chains than you. Uh, so uh, what you need to do is to find different ways to make sure that all these different stakeholders are uh, uh, motivated to collaborate with you. And, uh, and again, uh, what, what we've found in, in applying it to a lot of systems to systems, uh, there's no one-size-fits-all solution or process. Uh, uh, another challenge is uh, uh, emergence and, and human intensiveness. But, uh, yeah, uh, a lot of uh, people, when they're asked, yeah, what, do, what, they, what would they like to see on the screen for this application, will say, uh, well, I don't know for sure, but I'll know it when I see and so you can't really pre-specify the, the requirements. In a lot of cases, when people start using it, they will uh, find that the other things will help them or new versions of cloud services come along that, uh, that, that do a better job than they were currently doing, and, and, um, and the system will evolve away from what it originally uh, was thought were the requirements. Uh, uh, budgets and schedules are not pre-specifiable. Uh, basically, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in what's coming, going to happen uh, in, in the future, and uh, uh, uncertainty times impact equals risk exposure, so uh, uh, there's a lot of risk to deal with. Next chart uh, basically gives
is an example that uh, if, if you are uh, developing a, a uh, large system of systems or a piece of it uh, uh, like the uh, uh, healthcare.gov, uh, basically you'll find that uh, you are one of 55 different uh, uh, projects or organizations that are contributing to this, and you're doing your things on your own timeline, and if somebody wants to have a uh, preliminary design review, uh, it, it's it's very difficult because all these people are on different timelines. Um, and if somebody goes to a new version, uh, uh, it, everybody needs to uh, determine how they're going to adapt to, to these new versions and the like. So uh, this is going to make life a good deal more complex than it has been. I'll skip this chart. Uh, uh, other challenges are that uh, the pace of change is, is uh, 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 getting more and more rapid. That, uh, in, in competition, uh, people that are providing you with the software for cell phones are competing with a bunch of other cell phone vendors and uh, coming out with new versions three times a year and uh, and so there's a lot of change going on. Uh, uh, people's missions change as, as opportunities and, and challenges come up. Technology changes. Uh, commercial off-the-shelf or cloud services are, are changing. Um, uh, uh, Amazon.com has has a new version every 11 seconds. So uh, again, it's very hard to uh, uh, keep a uh, a stable situation. Um, so uh, if you want to avoid obsolescence, uh, uh, doing uh, writing the requirements and, and uh, uh, stabilizing them for three years is, is generally going to give you a, a solution that is uh, two years obsolete when, when you deliver it. So uh, again, what you need is, is processes that are more concurrent where you can concurrently evolve the uh, operational concept, the requirements, the architecture, the plans, the uh, uh, business case, and, and all the things that are critical to success uh, rather than doing all of this sequentially. And this means that you, you need both the prescience, the, the ability to uh, uh, anticipate uh, things that are coming along, and, and rapid adaptability that uh, enables you to uh, cover the things that you didn't anticipate. So again, software is very important, and, but humans are even more important in doing this. Uh, uh, another challenge is, as Grady Booch has, has identified, there are over 200 billion lines of, of legacy code in the world these days, and uh, uh, a lot of applications need to provide continuity, continuity of service with respect to these legacy applications, uh, which, uh, again, are, are frequently not well structured and not well understood. And uh, so uh, there's a challenge in uh, uh, not very many systems are greenfield where you have a nice clean um, whiteboard or sheet of paper that you can invent something from scratch. Uh, not only are things changing rapidly where you'd like to be very agile, but uh, uh, software is now the critical uh, success factor for most systems. And so uh, uh, people are looking for 24-7, always-on, never-fail systems and looking for a great deal of rigor in, in developing these and the challenge of uh, having well-controlled high assurance processes while you're doing agile adaptive processes and trying to synchronize and stabilize all of that uh, gets to be very complicated. And as we go along, we'll see how the incremental commitment spiral model addresses these. <clears throat> so uh, there is a thing called the cone of uncertainty, which basically says that early in the life cycle, uh, uh, you, you can only estimate the, the cost of a system to within a factor of two or four uh, because
because you're not quite sure which uh, Cox products or cloud systems to services will fit your application. Uh, you're not quite sure what the details are going to be or what some of your stakeholders are, are going to be uh, reprioritizing. And uh, even if you do converge at, at some point, what you're going to find is that if you lock yourself into this specification and, and spend three years building something uh, to satisfy that, that uh, the uncertainties in competition and technology and so forth are going to end up, we, you we wish you had been over here where the uh, marketplace currently is. Uh, we'll skip this chart uh, and go to uh, uh, say, uh, what is the incremental commitment spiral model? So, the, uh, hopefully, it is coming up. So it, it is a risk-driven framework for determining and evolving the, the best fit process. So it, it is not a one-size-fits-all process that says every project should start with requirements or every uh, project should start with a scrum or, or, or things like that. Uh, uh, and it uh, uh, determines, yeah, what are the risks in terms of assurance or in terms of agility that uh, that you need to address and and, and uh, integrates the strengths of, of the phased models and the risk-driven risk process models. So, well, another thing that's really important is that uh, the, the models are, are generally shown by diagrams and, and people uh, frequently over-interpret the diagrams and, and uh, miss uh, what some of the important principles are that underlie the uh, the, the model. So uh, the incremental commitment spiral model has four uh, key principles. One is that uh, uh, your system definition and evolution is is based on who your stakeholders are and, and what their value propositions are. So if, if they want something that uh, uh, is, is high assurance, uh, then that's uh, that that drives a lot of what you're doing. If they want something that is uh, easy to modify, or uh, uh, then that that will drive things. If it's, it's big and complex, uh, that will drive things. So uh, another thing is that it uh, it it uh, focuses on uh, the stakeholders uh, committing to. Uh, 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 the project because they can see value in it for themselves, but uh, not only do they commit, but they're accountable for their commitment. And the, uh, uh, the accountability is, is addressed by things like evidence that says, yeah, where's the evidence that they have done their part of the job? Uh, uh, rather than being sequential, it says that you're trying to concurrently define the system and, and its development and, and its life cycle. So uh, 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 again, you do this in a way that is, is risk driven and uh, a lot of the risk is, is determined by uh, whether or not you have evidence that if you go forward with, with a combination of COX products and cloud services that they're really going to interoperate and support what you need. And uh, we've been analyzed these principles and found that uh, 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 surveys of the uh, top five software projects in, in several years uh, used uh, most of these principles uh, to achieve their successes. So here, here is the, uh, the version uh, expansion of the spiral model that uh, makes it more explicit in, in terms of what it's doing. So again, it, like the original spiral model, it has a, a series of spirals. Uh, uh, and like the original spiral model, it, uh, it does things concurrently. It, it says you, you're concurrently improving your understanding of the requirements, the architecture, the business case, and the like. Uh, and, and, and you're growing the product and, and process detail as you go along. And you're doing this.
this in a way that's risk-driven. So if there's things that are low risk, you spend less time defining them than you do uh, defining and ensuring yourself that uh, the high-risk uh, parts of the system are going to work for you. So you can currently engineer the uh, products and processes, and uh, uh, not only do you determine uh, a, a set of solutions, uh, but you uh, uh, evidence that, that says uh, uh, the evidence is a first class deliverable, and, and it basically uh, is reviewed by independent experts. Uh, and shows evidence that, that if you build it to the architecture, it will satisfy the re requirements and be buildable within the budgets and schedule in your plan and, and satisfy your stakeholders. And any shortfalls in those are, are uncertainties that uh, this is a successful solution, and uncertainties are probabilities of loss, and probabilities of loss times impact of loss is risk exposure. <laughs> so basically, what you'll end up with at each one of these uh, decision points uh, is a, uh, uh, an assessment of what's the risk of going forward. And this is expanded over in the little thing in the corner here that says uh, if the risks are acceptable, uh, you go forward into the next uh, cycle. Uh, if the risks are high but addressable, then you stay back in this cycle and, and, and do further safety cases or prototypes or things that, that assure you that you're going in the right direction. Uh, if the risks are negligible, uh, uh, basically the spiral model says uh, there's a number of things that you may be able to skip that you already have assured yourself that uh, the system uh, infrastructure is scalable enough to satisfy the uh, uh, the requirements. Um, and if the risk is too high and unaddressable, uh, there's another arrow that goes out out, out from the uh, screen here that says uh, at this point you need to either discontinue the project, so there's an off-ramp that says don't continue something that isn't going to get you any benefits, uh, or to rescope the project to something that uh, uh, is uh, uh, has a good prospect of success. So uh, again, uh, what happens at each one of these review points uh, as you get more and more uh, uh, definition of the, the, the business case or return on investment for of, of the investment in software, uh, uh, you uh, develop the foundations that you're going to build the system on and evolve the system on top of, and uh, and develop increments of it. Also, it is concurrent in that uh, basically, uh, as you are uh, developing the, the uh, first increment, uh, you're keeping that stable by uh, having a separate team of people handling the change traffic and technology and competition and things like that. And uh, doing a, a triage that says, how many of these things can be uh, done while keeping the, this uh, development stable, and how many things need to be postponed to future increments. So uh, that's basically what the model looks like. Uh, uh, it looks a little complicated, but uh, there are a number of special cases that uh, that make uh, that uh, certain risk patterns will will. Uh, 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 drive you toward agile or architected agile or formal methods or, or a number of special cases that we've identified for the for the model. Uh, uh, the, uh, the ICSM is uh, uh, very similar to uh, uh, lean principles in manufacturing or lean. Uh, uh, software engineering, uh, as uh, uh, espoused by the Poppendikes and Craig Larman and a number of people. And um, uh, so uh, if you look at the lean principles, uh, they are very similar to the principles in, in the ICSM. The stakeholder value-based system definition and evolution is is basically saying, yeah, let's, let's see the whole. Let's make sure that we are understand who all the stakeholders are and that they are going to benefit from the system. Uh, uh, 
empower the team uh, means that the developers are stakeholders and they, they need to be empowered as well. Uh, incremental commitment basically uh, uh, says that you want to amplify learning and uh, 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 determine whether the requirements are achievable using a, a combination of, of uh, technologies or, or not. And, uh, and accountable so that you decide as late as possible and make sure that uh, you know that uh, what you're doing is, is going to uh, uh, result in a successful system. Uh, also, you're doing things concurrently across multiple disciplines like hardware and software and human factors, so like uh, uh, definition and, and development and, and, and deployment and evolution and, and things like that. Um, uh, and this is, again, similar to the principles in Lean that say, yeah, deliver as fast as possible, do it concurrently rather than sequentially, and, and again, empower the team. Evidence and risk-driven decision-making basically says, yeah, you, you want to build integrity in. And before you make these commitments, you want to have a good, solid base of, of, ex, of, of evidence that the commitment uh, will lead to a success and not to a failure. And to eliminate waste and, and not uh, 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 end up uh, chewing up a lot of resources uh, that don't give you any, any stakeholder value. So uh, I will skip the nature and origins and uh, uh, ask you a question. That uh, yeah, Suppose you are off at a casino and you have a choice in uh, playing various gambling games. You, you can choose uh, roulette uh, or you can choose uh, games like poker or blackjack. I, I guess I should have done a, run a, a little poll to see how many people choose roulette and how many people choose poker or blackjack, uh, usually 99% of the people will choose poker and blackjack. Uh, if you ask them, why do you, uh, why, why do you uh, uh, prefer roulette, uh, frequently the answer is, uh, I really love the rush I get when I find that I'm in total lack of control over my destiny and I'm just waiting to see where that little white ball will end up. Um, and, and a lot of software acquisitions are like playing roulette. You, you uh, uh, publish a bunch of requirements, you pick the lowest bidder, and you outsource it to them, and, and you wait around and, and uh, hope that that little uh, outsourcer is, is going to uh, land you in a, in a successful situation. Um, incremental commitment basically says... Uh, you probably don't want to stick all of your uh, chips in uh, at, at, at the beginning. You want to put a few chips in and, and see your cards and see some of your other competitors' cards and uh, uh, make decisions as to whether you have a lousy hand and you want to fold and save your chips for a, a future hand uh, or uh, how much you want to com commit to proceed. So... Uh, 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 this is uh, a, a much uh, uh, better way to go. Uh, a good example is one that uh, is in a book uh, uh, called Human Systems Integration Systems Development Process uh, that uh, was based on a National Research Council study. That uh, This case study was one in which there was a demonstration that showed uh, that uh, the, the usual remotely piloted vehicle took at least two uh, 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 human-in-the-loop uh, people to fly one airplane, uh, uh, but uh, in a lot of cases, they were backed up by a, another half dozen or 20 people uh, who were doing analysis of, of the, the, the situation. Uh, uh, and uh, what people wanted was something that uh, 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 one person could control four of these uh, remotely piloted vehicles. And uh, a, uh, uh, a demo was made that, that showed that using various kinds of agent-based techniques, uh, you could uh, 
show that you could keep these things flying in uh, in formation and ev evading obstacles and communicating with each other and and, and the like. Uh, and uh, based on this, uh, uh, the total commitment approach that uh, that uh, ended up uh, emerging from this was uh, uh, a, a bunch of people and in, in, in senior management seeing the demo and saying, uh, that's what we need, that's what we want, uh, and uh, uh, coming up with uh, uh, asking, yeah, what, what would it take to do this, and getting a rough estimate of a billion dollars, and then saying, uh, Let's uh, let's put a billion dollars on 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 uh, uh, on the, the square four to one and uh, send an RFP out with a sunny day statement of work that uh, basically didn't uh, account for some of the uh, off nominal conditions. Uh, the winning bidder actually proposed to save the taxpayers two hundred million dollars and saying we can do this job for eight hundred million dollars. We, we've done even better agents than the, the demo showed. Uh, we can do a view in 120 days and have this in 40 months for you, but without any evidence uh, behind it. And again, uh, uh, the requirements were fixed price and, and uh, just covered the sunny day use cases. Uh, by the PDR, there were a lot of outstanding risks, a lot of undefined interfaces, uh, a lot of things that didn't work uh, uh, when uh, the communications went down or they uh, were trying to control uh, different versions of the RPVs with the same uh, pilot and, and things like that. Uh, but nobody wanted to fail PDR, so they gave them a go-ahead, and uh, by the time they'd spent all the money and time, they were half through way through integration and test, which was basically uh, a third of the way through the whole project. And again, they they finally finished in 80 months, spending three billion, and only got a uh, thing that uh, enabled you to get a one-to-one -one initial operational capability with uh, uh, each uh, uh, RPV taking uh, one person rather than two. Uh, uh, an incremental commitment approach would basically one way to do it, and it's not the only way, would be to uh, uh, use competitive prototyping. It says, you know, let's uh, take $25 million uh, and uh, give contracts to four uh, uh, competitors and uh, have them take their smartest people and see if they can beat the uh, one person, uh, one RPV being controlled by two people uh, and uh, keep $5 million for evaluating what they come up with, uh, including some rainy day scenarios, and and basically finding that uh, you could beat one to two, but you couldn't get four to one. You, you might, you most likely could get one to one. Uh, so uh, uh, that looked like a, a good enough increase that you uh, uh, said, let's let's put some more chips on the table. We'll put $75 million in. We'll down-select to three uh, competitors and uh, uh, see what they can do in, in building scaled-down remotely piloted vehicles and uh, spend $15 million evaluating this. And, uh, and uh, so, again, uh, based on this, the, the results were that they could do uh, – one to one, most likely, they down selected the two, gave them eighty million dollars each, and uh, uh, and had a uh, full scale operational exercise in which the winner was chosen, and uh, uh, so uh, basically uh, by that time they they knew what they they needed uh, and uh, they could build it in the remaining six hundred and seventy five million dollars. So they in a billion dollars in forty two months. They, they had what they needed. So, uh, so again, here, here's the incremental commitment spiral model in, in the spiral view. We'll, we'll now show some other views of it that are equivalent, but uh, give you a better feel for what it's like in terms of a, 
phase view or a, uh, a concurrent view and, and the like. So here, here's a phase view that basically says that uh, there, there are basically three incremental definition phases and then a series of incremental development and operational phases. And, and again, what you're doing is concurrently engineering the uh, uh, system definition and the system <coughs> Uh, solution, and initially this is uh, doing initial scoping and then uh, making sure that you had a, 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 a well thought out concept of operation and an investment analysis that showed that uh, this would be a good return on investment, but still not having worked out all of the uh, thing, uh, the foundations that uh, that the system would be built on. Uh, so each one of these things would uh, produce a, uh, a higher and uh, a, a more and more detailed definition, and not just a definition, but evidence that if you built it uh, to that definition, you would get a successful system. Uh, and again, at the end of each one of these, you had these risk-based uh, uh, decisions. And and again, if you were uh, in a competitive marketplace and uh, your first uh, 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 users are going to be early adopters who are willing to beta test uh, a buggy product, uh, then you're, you're willing to go forward uh, in order to get to market quickly. Uh, uh, if you're building something that's safety critical and you haven't done the safety cases, you do higher risk and you want to uh, stop and do some more safety cases. So uh, uh, the risk pattern determine uh, what kind of process are, are you going to have? Is it going to be more permissive or more rigorous and, and, and things like that? Another view is uh, similar to the hump diagram that Philippe Krushten came up with for the rational unified process. Uh, elaborated into a number of additional concurrent activities. So the current activities here are uh, uh, evaluating, uh, envisioning opportunities, uh, scoping the system, and saying how big is it going to be, understanding the stakeholders and their needs, and uh, initially not uh, uh, calling these things requirements, but calling them objectives or goals uh, so that uh, you don't call them requirements and then you ha until you have enough evidence that uh, that you could really build it to, to, to these. And, and at, at that point, it's, you, it's, you, you want to get more formal and call them requirements. And uh, currently, architect the system, which means architecting the human part of it, the software part of it, and the hardware part of it. Uh, uh, you want to do the plans that say how long is it going to take and how much money is it going to take and what kind of critical skills and facilities and equipment is it going to take. Uh, and, uh, and then you want to generate this feasibility evidence, which I'll explain in, in the next uh, chart, uh, that basically says uh, here's how you uh, pull all of these uh, definitions together to determine whether you have a, a feasible solution or not. And basically, your stakeholders look at that evidence and decide whether they're willing to commit to going forward or, or, or needing more homework to be done. So uh, again, if, if you have a, a separate team that are, that are doing all these different things, or it is very much of a recipe <coughs> Chaos, and so what you'd like to do at these decision milestones is to have a way of synchronizing and, and stabilizing uh, the people that are doing all these separate things, and that's what uh, uh, the evidence is doing for you. Uh, basically, uh, the evidence that is produced at each one of these milestones by the developers and validated by independent experts says, uh, if we built the system to the architecture that we've specified, here's the evidence that it will satisfy the requirement. Not just the features, but the interfaces and the levels of service and, and the evolution requirements. Uh, 
here's the evidence that it will support the operational concept and get all the operators and maintainers and, uh, and users and administrators uh, to be able to successfully operate the system. And here's the evidence that it will be buildable within the budgets and schedules in the plan and, and the evidence that it will generate a viable return on investment and generate satisfactory outcomes for all of the success critical stakeholders. So again, uh, can you uh, uh, do all of this perfectly? Uh, clearly not for a complex system or a system of systems. Uh, so there will be uncertainties and shortfalls in the evidence, and a shortfall in evidence is an uncertainty. And again, uncertainty times impact equals risk. And so uh, basically you identify the risks and say, here is my risk mitigation plan that will resolve this risk, uh, uh, or uh, here, uh, here is my solution that has already solved it. So again, the, the stakeholders look at this evidence and say, uh, that's too risky, I need some more homework done, uh, 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 or uh, uh, that's, uh, we, we need to move forward, and, and the risk management plans for covering the risks uh, satisfactory to proceed. And again, this is something that uh, you could do even with a waterfall model or, or a uh, an architected agile approach uh, uh, to make sure that the architecture is scalable or securable before you uh, jump into an easiest first solution that, uh, that when you get to build six you find it can't scale or can't uh, be securable. So again, uh, the, the stage two is incremental development and operations. And as I mentioned, what you're doing is concurrently engineering uh, the uh, uh, operational part of the, the current increment, the, the next increment that you're doing the development of, and uh, handling the change traffic with a separate team who, who is uh, rebaselining the architecture for the next increment. So the reason you want to do that is that you've got this challenge that you, you want to uh, adapt to rapid change uh, and be agile, but on the other hand, you want to be rigorous and do high assurance. So uh, if you want to do that, you, you want to make sure that these developers uh, have a short increment to, to build so there's not a lot of change to destabilize them and uh, that they don't have a lot of unforeseeable change traffic that, uh, that they have to uh, uh, depart from development to, uh, to run off and, and try to uh, solve. Uh, so, uh, so again, you, you want to have short increments, you want to have stable increments, and uh, so you want to take as much of the change and foresee, a, foresee it and, and build it into design patterns or generics or, or things that make it easy to a, accommodate the changes in the formats of, of uh, reports or invoices or, or things like that. Uh, but again, there will be a bunch of, of unforeseeable change, and if you want to uh, address that, uh, 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 you, you don't want to destabilize these people. You, you want to have a separate uh, team of people who are doing uh, a uh, taking the unforeseeable change and uh, uh, adapting the uh, future uh, increments of the system to be able to uh, accommodate those. And if you really want uh, a great deal of high assurance, then if you want to have another independent team who is verifying and validating all of the artifacts that these people produce and uh, feeding back their concerns so that uh, there's a, a short time between uh, defects emerging and defects getting fixed uh, and reducing the, the, the cost of, of rework. Uh, I will skip the next chart, which is a little complicated to cover, uh, and uh, say that uh, another thing that uh, the system, the, the model has, is an electronic process guide that uh, basically we use in teaching it uh, over the last uh, 15 years, and uh, each uh, 
person on the team, you know, what their roles are, what their deliverables are, and uh, what their interactions are with the other people. And uh, so, again, uh, it uh, uh, gives you a, a way of saying, you know, here's, here's what an operational concept analysis is going to do. Uh, again, the, the principles really trump the diagrams, and uh, what we'll show now is a counterexample of a system that uh, didn't use these principles and uh, ended up with a, a big failure, and a system that did use them and ended up with a success. So uh, uh, Bank of America MasterNet was a trust management system that uh, basically uh, uh, had all of these red lines here are conflicts between the uh, value propositions of the users who wanted a lot of features, three and a half million, million lines of code worth, wanted to change their mind about requirements, be compatible with old uh, existing applications, <laughs> uh, instant response 24-7 levels of service, and, and the like. The acquirers had $22 million in nine months, so which you can't build three and a half million lines of code in between. They chose a developer who uh, basically had a system that could do a small trust management system but could not scale up to the things that the users needed and produce things that were incompatible with the maintainers. So uh, basically it did not uh, uh, satisfy uh, principle one. It, uh, it got over-concerned with the voice of the customer and didn't listen to the voice of the acquirer and the developer and the maintainer. Uh, uh, it didn't do an incremental commitment. It tried to do it all at once. Uh, it didn't prioritize features, uh, it didn't prototype operational scenarios, and it, uh, it didn't do a thorough evaluation of the scalability of the, of the, the vendor that they got uh, uh, who was not able, able to satisfy the budget and schedule. Uh, a successful application was one that was documented in this uh, human system integration uh, book uh, that uh, uh, as you can see, is fairly complex from a hardware standpoint, fairly complex from a software standpoint, in that it's a multi-channel uh, intravenous infusion pump that uh, uses a touch screen program the doses of medications and drugs that the patient is getting. Uh, and uh, it used the incremental commitment spiral process to uh, uh, do a lot of extensive interviews and field operations, observations with the users, doing prototyping, competitive analysis, and uh, getting enough evidence that they felt that they were in a good competitive uh, uh, position to proceed. Evaluation phase, prioritized features, uh, uh, evaluated different display vendors, came up with a plan and a business case analysis and a safety, uh, this was a safety critical uh, device, and, and so they had a number of different kinds of risk assessments, uh, and, uh, but they uh, identified the risks and said these are addressable, so we'll go ahead into the uh, foundations phase, or the arch yeah. and um, so uh, here they had a number of, uh, uh, of, uh, of decisions to make about yeah, how, how many pumping channels to have and, and how to uh, program them and prototype the user interface and uh, 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 do failure modes and effects analyses and, and uh, use a, an actual teaching hospital to see whether this thing was really going to work. And, and again, uh, they've, they've got the architecture fully uh, uh, defined uh, and analyzed how it would work in both the nominal and off-nominal cases and uh, had uh, enough uh, evidence that they
Um, shall we move to the question and the answer question? Getting no sound. Yeah. Hi, folks. Apologies. Uh, it sounds like our presenter may have dropped out for the moment, so if you could just stay on the line for a couple of minutes, we'll see if we can get him back. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear Hello? you. Hello? Hello? Okay, I'm I'm I've switched over to the cell phone. I hope it's uh hearable. Yeah. I can hear yeah, you. Yeah, there you're back. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, good. So we finished and we're ready for questions. Okay. So let's move on to the questions. And answers, and uh, our uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Bain. Our first question is: uh, uh, Is this ICSM still in the research stage, or it has been already deployed or implemented in industry? And what kind of industry is ACM um, applicable for? Well, as you can see, it, it has been applied in the medical industry with the uh, uh, the medical infusion pump. Uh, uh, it has uh, been applied to several uh, applications that are more or less supply chain kind of, of applications. It has been uh, applied to uh, very large systems of systems, uh, uh, which uh, had uh, uh, 18 million lines of code in them and, uh, and uh, an incremental development where the increments were, were uh, uh, were two years long, uh, and it has been applied to uh, over a hundred projects uh, uh, at USC, where we uh, use the model to uh, teach software engineering by having the students build real systems for real clients. And um, so every year we get uh, feedback and and uh, improve the model based on that. Okay, our second question. There, there is a what? book that is coming out on it uh, that will be published in, in, in 2014. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. The second question is, what types of risks can be used to make the risk-based decision? Uh, well, the, the, the risks are, are basically... Uh, 
determined by risk exposure, which is the probability that uh, something will go wrong times the impact on on your system and, and your uh, value propositions if, if it does go wrong. And uh, so uh, in some cases, it's hard to estimate the probabilities numerically. So in, in a lot of cases, you will do things like uh, use a scale of 0 to 10 to uh, estimate the relative probability and the relative impact and, and be able to prioritize the risks based on that. And thank you. And the third question is, uh, we found that the stakeholders may change over the life of the project, particularly extending into the supporting phase. How can we create system definitions that will satisfy this evolving set of stakeholders and their needs? Uh, yeah, this is a, 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 a problem that is uh, uh, Specifically unforeseeable, but generically uh, you can uh, 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 identify uh, basically sources of uh, uh, of change. In a lot of cases, what we find is that. Uh, excuse me. Uh, 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 if, if you have a resource-limited situation, what you try to do is prioritize the features and build the top priority features initially that people want the most. Uh, uh, usually, though, that will leave a number of below-the-line features that uh, frequently people forget about. But the most important thing is to use those as, as a first-cut the assessment of what are people going to want after you build the initial operational capability. And so you try to architect the system to not only support the initial operational capability, but the evolution requirements that say, here's our best guess as, as to what we're going to need in the future. Okay, thank you, Barry. And then the next question would be, um, given what you have already said, should it, it have been anticipated that the software for the Affordable Care Act will be unlikely?